What started on the drawing board became a trophy. Engineers at Federal Premium Ammunition designed the trophy-bonded tip bullet to deliver devastating bone-crushing performance. With a translucent polymer tip and boat tail design, Trophy Tip provides flatter trajectories and improved accuracy. Plus, a solid copper shank jacket and bonded core mean high weight retention and deep penetration. Trophy Bonded Tip from Federal Premium Ammunition. Claim your trophy. Welcome from the Deer and Deer Hunting Headquarters here in Iola, Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us for Deer Talk Now once again. I'm Dan Schmidt, along again with Brad Rux. Brad, another good show in store today. Uh, we're taking a few reader questions. We have a special guest. Our special guest is going to be Tom Rainey, our friend from Browning Trail okay. Cameras. And today is going to be all about trail cameras. But, you know, we watched that federal commercial, and I see that. You know, and it's like, what, the one thing that just surprises me is the quality and ammunition that you can get today as opposed to when we were younger and you'd go out and buy a box of shells for seven eight bucks i think it was when we were growing up but the, the really cool thing about federal is i've been shooting those trophy bonded bullets and i, I actually wrote this down because i i couldn't remember i've shot them in i've shot deer with a 270 a seven millimeter 08 uh remington 08 a 308 and a 30 out six the 30 out six was with the, the trophy bonded bear claw but that bullet is the way they design that thing is just, it really packs a punch. It's awesome for deer hunting. You know, and you really can't appreciate, you know, the technology behind them until, I mean, we're fortunate we get to go to the shows and we get to see all the research, all the ballistic gels, all that stuff that they shoot through. And to see the expansion that these things will do, it's just amazing. And, and I've told you, I mean, my biggest concern was when, when the kids started shooting that little 243, I was like, Man, if you shoot them, you know, behind the yeah, shoulder, the what's going to happen? It's going to bam. It, and that's <laughs> it drops them right off their feet. What I really like about just modern bullets is that the, the way they're built, like you said, it's, you think it would be something simple, but there's a lot of technology that goes into them. And the weight, the weight retention on these things, the, the sheer um, energy that they're putting into the deer, it's basically dumping all that energy into the deer. And when you, if you're lucky enough that you don't blow through a deer and you can pull, pull that, that bullet out of maybe the off shoulder or something, Really cool stuff. So I recommend everybody just checking out the technology. We, we wrote it about again in the equipment annual this year, but just check out the technology behind these bullets. It's something else. Um, today's show, we're talking all about trail cameras. How many trail cameras? I know you run a lot of them on your property. How many do you have out right now? Right now we have six out, and uh, once the season hits, you know, when we're going down and in and out a little bit more, we'll probably have 12 of them out. And that's only on 300 acres. It sounds like a lot. But I'm amazed at how many times we have a spot where it's literally a little corner. If you looked at it for acreage-wise, it's probably an acre and a half. And it's got a pond in the middle, food, two different food plots with some mature hardwoods around it. And we'll put three different cameras in there. And I'm amazed at how many different bucks we do get. And very seldom will you get a picture of, say there's a scrape in each one of those corners. Very seldom will I get the same buck in all three of those scrapes. So we put that many cameras in there just to figure out exactly where the bucks are. And some of them definitely have a hot spot where they're always up on the top end of it and some like the bottom end of it. And, and you know, the more you have, the more knowledge you have. You're going to become, you know, a little great bit Great scouting successful. tools, great scouting tools. I mean, they've been around for a while, but the, and we're going to learn more from Tom here in a second. But what you can do with these cameras now, just from, not only from a, a photo standpoint, but from a video standpoint, and just in the the quality of the images and when you can capture images middle of the night bad weather rain you're gonna you're gonna get great scouting information to not only tell you what deer you have but when when they're showing up and where they're showing up another cool thing you guys got to check out the live trail feed on the home page two really nice bucks on there just about every morning. Uh, I think it's been about 5.30, 6.00. to 6.30. Now, yeah. you can actually take that toggle bar and toggle it back. So if you if you don't get to looking at that camera until later in the morning or later in the day, just take that toggle switch right there on the home page, toggle it back, and you're going to see basically everything from daylight all the way through the rest of the day. 
A lot of nice deer showing up there. Two really nice bucks. I think one was a 10 and one was an 8. Yeah. It kind of gets you excited just to think about it. And speaking of getting excited for <clears throat> um, hunting season, uh, August is Tree Stand Safety Month. And we kick that off this week at DeerAndDeerHunting.com. We have articles, we have video, we have store specials. And check that all out. I mean, we have tons of really good information. And it's stuff that's really going to help you not only stay safer, but have a better plan that you can implement going forward into it, whether it's bow season for you. I know we're starting to bow hunt here uh, in less than a month. I'm going to be heading to North Dakota to bow hunt and um, a, a lot of good information. But one of the products that we have in Shop Deer, we just got these in. Highly recommend you checking this out if you need a new safety harness and you want a good one. This is the Hunter Safety Systems Safety System Ultra Light Harness. We have these in Shop Deer. It, this is one of my favorite. Um, I have several safety harnesses. This is one of my favorites. Um, check it out. Tyler's going to show you a couple pictures here right now. What I like about this harness is that it it's built, lives up to its name. It's very light. You can wear this over your clothes. You can wear it underneath your jacket. So it's very versatile. I, I do it both ways. If it's um, early season, wearing a lot of light clothes, I like to wear it over the top. But if we get closer to gun season, it's cold outside, I, I, I'll take that harness, I'll wear it underneath my jacket. The tether comes out, it's a, it's a great harness. Check it out. It's on sale right now, Shop Deer, I think it's $109. I hope I got the price right on that. And again, Deer Talk in the checkout box and you're gonna get that, that special extra discount. Everybody who asked a question last week, be sure that you email me. I'm gonna say it slow this time because some people didn't get it, dan.schmidt at fwmedia.com. Send me an email. We're going to get you out your prize package. Uh, a lot of people, some people are actually struggling already into today. Hey, Dan, you, you answered my question. Brad answered my question. You guys are going to get the rut calendar from us uh, free just for asking a question that we used on Deer Talk. We have several. Facebook has uh, uh, been, a lot of people on Facebook have been asking questions. We're going to get those to Tom here in a second. But uh, that's what we got going on today. Brad, let's get Tom on the line. Let's talk a little bit about scouting and trail cameras. You want to give him a call? Right, here we go. No, no. Um, yes, Tom. Hey, Tom, this is Brad from Deer and Deer Hunting and Dan Schmidt. Hey, guys, how are you? Good. Good, Tom. Thanks for joining us for Deer Talk Now today. We know you have a busy schedule, and we really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to join us. That is not a problem. It that, that seems that this time of year you jump from trade show to trade show, so. I have a few minutes at my desk, and I'll be more than happy to give it to you. Awesome. Perfect. Hey, first off, you know, I, I got one of the new cameras here at my desk, but before we talk to it, get, give the listeners a little bit of background with Browning Trail Cameras, you know, because everybody thinks it's a new company, which it is, but you guys have some experience behind you. We do. We do. We, uh, you know, there, there's a, team, a core team of about four people that have been involved you know, you'd hate to say from day one, but from the early beginnings. And I would say that, you know, I, I get to have this conversation a few times a year at various trade shows, but, you know, our combined experience in the game camera category sits at about, you know, right around 50 years almost. Wow. Uh, so I think, I think that our experience has played a part in getting off to a good start, delivering quality products to market, uh, you know, it just seemed like a good fit when the opportunity started to present itself for us to kind of come together and share our experiences in this. Tom, we've had a lot of questions come in uh, via Twitter and Facebook this morning, even some questions coming out in off of Google+. Brad and I are going to just try to uh, just pelt you with questions here from the viewers, and hopefully um, we're not going to wear you out too quickly. But uh, I'm going to let Brad go first, and we're just going to go one after another, and hopefully we can get everybody's question answered today. Well, well, here's the first one, and I, I have an example of it right here at my desk. It seems like the trend in trail cameras, Tom, is going small. Smaller is better. And I have the Sub Micro uh, in the Dark Ops right here at my desk. It's one of them that you just recently sent us. Is, is that the trend? Are cameras getting small, and how, how much smaller can these things get? Well, I, I think that that's the key question. Uh, the small has obviously been a trend, but... There comes a point of diminishing returns where you want to put quality components in a camera and those take up a certain amount of space and then you need to put a power supply in there. Uh, so while that has been the trend to get smaller and smaller, I, I don't know that we're not at the point now where we might be reaching, like I said, the point of diminishing returns where 
I don't know if that can continue to be the trend. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we're pretty much at the apex of that whole journey as far as getting smaller, getting smaller. You know, there might be some technologies that present themselves down the road, but I think we're pretty much where we need to be at this point, at least. And it is really cool to see them that small. Tom, I'm going to get right to some of the reader questions here for you. Um, the first one is going to come from, this is off of Facebook. This is coming from Aaron Smith. Aaron, you're getting a free deer and deer hunting rut calendar for asking your question today for Tom. And Tom, Aaron wants to know, how high do you normally place your cameras? And do you, uh, basically what he's getting at is, do you use the tactic where you mount your cameras up to shoot down on deer? Is there a benefit to doing that? And if so, why? Uh, I, there is, in some instances, based on, you know, sight lines, for lack of a better word. Uh, in some instances, you have people that use these cameras for security. Uh, in those instances, the higher angles seem to work if you're trying to capture an entrance and things like that, where you're concerned that somebody might come through during the daylight hours or just happen to notice that it's dark. Uh, occasionally there's some concern with the standard infrared flash cameras. Uh, I think that's usually a matter of personal preference, but, you know, our personal experience in the office and with most of the people on staff here is that we don't really concern ourselves too much with getting, you know, 10, 12, 14 feet in the air, whatever that number may be. Uh, it's more of a, we'd like to extend that range. And if you're pointing that camera down from 14, 15 feet in the air at a 45 degree angle, you do sacrifice some of that range that we've built into the cameras. And so we like to try to set these up where we might be able to reach out and see some deer that are 45, 60 feet uh, out there and maybe possibly see more than we would if we limited our range by pointing straight down at a feeder or something. So what you're saying essentially is um, the, from the IR aspect, that should people be concerning themselves that the IR is spooking deer? I know a lot of guys think that. Um, do you have any uh, background information on that? Uh, most of what we have at this point is anecdotal uh, in the sense that, you know, we talk to, it's realistic to say we talk to thousands and thousands of people a year about their camera usage. And I think a good example is one of the pieces of property that I hunt has a road that goes through the property. It's a county road. So I don't know if the deer think that brake lights and red lights and everything are all the same, but they just don't seem to be bothered by it. Whereas I talk to other people that are in more remote locations, they seem to have a concern that, you know, if they have their camera on video and runs for 10 seconds, that the red flow does attract the deer's attention. Uh, so I think that maybe geography can take some part in that, in the sense that uh, some deer in some locations are seem to be bothered by it, and some in other locations don't. Uh, you know, the environment, things like that all seem to play a factor in it as far as... That's, a, that's a pretty good point that you make, because I, I've had cameras on both public and private land, and on the public land where it's a little bit farther away, it seems, I don't want to say they're spooked, but they do seem to notice the cameras more, and I think that might just be a... a that might just be a symptom of pressure. I agree. I think it's a learned trait. I, I, I mean, I think if, if you have a fawn and he's been getting his pictures taken, you know, when he turns into a three, four, five-year-old deer, he doesn't really care about the camera because he's so used to it and he knows that it really doesn't promote any kind of danger. And we notice this, you know, I run trail cameras hard, Tom. I got a lot of them out and we, we run them harder as the season gets going. But um, I'll notice if I, I, I have a transient buck that comes through, you know, yep. e even if he stays on there and we visually see him in the food plots, he has a knack of, of avoiding the trail cameras after you get a good picture of him. And I think right. it's because he's freaked out from it, you know, because he's not used to it and he freaks out where, you know, say I have a four-year-old buck or even a five-year-old buck that's lived on my place all the while, that thing will come right up there and make the scrape in front of that camera every single night he comes out in that same food plot. It's, it's, it's kind out. of a, it's unique. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. We, uh, we hear that a lot, or actually see it a lot. You know, people that have used cameras over the course of several years, as a deer ages and grows up in a neighborhood or a stretch of woods or whatever you may call it, they, uh, if that camera's strapped in the same place virtually year, every year, year in and year out, they don't, they just seem to get used to it and they realize it's not a threat and it doesn't seem to bother. That's a, that's a good segue right there, Tom. And the next question, also from Facebook, 
This is coming from Sean Heaton, and just what you said, um, how long can I keep my camera out there? And basically, I think what Sean's getting at here is what a lot of people ask us every year. Can a guy leave that camera basically in place and just swap out the batteries and change the cards, or do you recommend something else? Uh, you know, uh, from personal experience, I don't leave it out all year, but I think that's just a matter of personal preference. We do have users that have left their cameras out for, you know, the entire calendar year. Uh, I think as long as you're doing the routine maintenance with the batteries, uh, you know, you double check the latches, your clasp, you know, the angles, all those things, I, I don't foresee there being any trouble, particularly with our cameras. We've, uh, one of the reasons we can't get really cheap with our cameras is because we did invest in some components that are designed to weather the elements, if you will. So, you know, you buy a good quality camera, you shouldn't have any problem leaving that particular camera out. Almost a year, I, I actually left my Browning camera out. It was for almost three months last fall, and all the way up until December, when it got really cold here. I mean, we we're talking December. We had days below zero. That thing was still right. taking. That thing was still taking video. Video. Clips. It, was, it was really good performance. Yeah, I, I tell people when I get that question just in public at trade shows, I tell people I put my cameras out uh, at the beginning of August last year. And I'm in Tennessee, so my climate is a little more temperate. But I took those cameras out beginning of August last year, and I did not take them out of the woods until right before turkey season at the end of wow. uh, beginning of March. Maybe. Wow, that's pretty good. Brad, why don't you uh, field the next question here? Hey, I, I just got a question for you. Since we talked a little bit about the, the black, the no-glow, you know, that's been so popular. How big, you know, as a percentage, is that market of cameras growing? Because right now, I mean, back in the day when I started running trail cameras, it was all flash. You know, and right now you can barely find flash cameras. So is the no glow more prevalent than just LEDs, or, or where does that market uh, stand? You know, I want to say that it, it's, again, it's a, uh, I don't think it's growing as fast as some would lead you to believe. And I say that because we've recently been to several trade shows and one of the things that you do sacrifice when you go to the no glow night vision and visible infrared flash is you do sacrifice a little of your nighttime image quality yeah. uh, because you just can't illuminate the subject as well when uh, you use that invisible flash, if you will. Uh, and the standard infrared does have better range. It tends to take better nighttime images, and the reason for that is uh, in our cameras in particular, if it's a standard infrared flash to illuminate the subject a little better, we've got smart technology that actually speeds the shutter up. Uh, so you get the opportunity to take a better quality picture. Uh, but I guess as far as the trend, I, I don't know. You, you may laugh when I tell you this, but the shows, the last two shows that we attended, we had more conversations with people asking us about the white flash being reintroduced then we did questions about the black flash camera. Mm -hmm. That's because we all want that nice, you know, four-color well, image four of that deer at night. And you don't get that with the night photos. Yes. Right. So. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I don't know that, uh, I guess it's trendy to have that conversation, at least uh, and talk about it. Hey, it's getting big. But, you know, most of the people that we talk about that want to make the move into that use cameras for security purposes mm -hmm. or they're close to a well-traveled area where they don't want to run, run the risk of a human seeing that red glow and taking their camera and things like that. So. Yep. It's a good, good thing. We're talking with Tom Rainey from Browning Trail Cameras. Next question coming in from Robert from Facebook. Robert wants to know, how do I format an SD card and what kind of SD cards can I use? Uh, I, can, I can speak uh, to our cameras in particular. Uh, when you want, if you want to format the card, the easiest process to go through, our menu option, is, I mean, it's, you know, anybody that's used one will tell you that it's really easy to go through. But once you hit mode, if you'll go down to the option that says delete all and just go ahead and delete all, hit yes, that will actually format the card in the camera for you. Uh, so you don't have to worry about jumping nice. from one operating system on your computer into another. That'll do it for you right there on the camera. Uh, and as far as, uh, oh, the type of card, we actually 
actually recommend the SDHC card uh, with no lower than a class four. And the reason we say that is the high end components that we put into our cameras do, it's, it's a matter of, you know, we start to get a little techy here, but they write data a little faster than a subpar component would. So with that said, an SDHC class four card is able to receive that data as fast as our camera can write it. Uh, again, that might be getting a little techy. No, it's not. Tom, and, and a question I have, and I don't know if this was user, user error on my part or the fact I wasn't formatting my cards correctly, but when I have a, a camera, a lot of times the, the timestamp and the, uh, you know, all that information that's on there is all wacky. Like the next time I come to pull that card, is it because I'm not formatting that card correctly? Uh, that, that can be a contributor to that. Uh, you know, there's a few variables in there, but the short answer is that that can be, you know, if it's a format, uh, if it's not the proper format, that could contribute to that. So what would you recommend, like, when a guy has that camera out there and goes and pulls that card, basically getting that card, downloading your images, and then deleting everything off that card and putting it back in the camera, correct? That, that is the process I go through. I try to have two SD cards for every camera. I'll put the SD card in. Uh, whenever I go to check the camera, I take the replacement SD card with me. I walk out to the woods. I pull that card. I drop the other one in. And when I always put the new one in, I always do go through that process I told you about where I scroll down, I hit delete, just to make sure that I didn't, you know, I have a tendency to hit the wrong button on a computer from time to time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I want to make sure that I'm not doing that. Uh, and I just take that last safety step, if you will, every time I put one back in the camera. That's, that's great information to have because a lot of us, we don't do that. And it's a simple thing that if you have that process, it's as simple as, right. you know, two cards. When you get there, just you, you know you deleted it, but just do it again and start all over again. And it, it's, it's a good process to have. Especially when you yeah, deal with... What I do, and this, this might be a little overkill on my part, I have, you know, a lot of times when you buy the SD card, uh, you buy one of our SD cards, they come in a small plastic container. I actually have those numbered. Uh, and then I keep a spreadsheet where, like, camera one goes to the field on the north side. So it's in the spreadsheet. So then I know what cards I'm flipping in and out. And when I get back to look at it in the computer, I know what field I'm looking at before I have to figure it out. Oh, that's good information. That's a great tip. That's, that's a great tip. tip. Hey, I got a quick question for you, Tom. As, say somebody's brand new to trail cameras and they're looking at your line, and you know, and you got multiple cameras, which one would you recommend? Somebody that's not quite not, not, not the brightest bulb in the box like myself, I would say, you know, the 3XR, which is the Spec Ops, is the one that I use the most, primarily because, you know, it has the two-inch color monitor on that camera. And when you look at that camera, you can scroll through pictures, but I don't use it for that purpose. I use it to make sure my camera's pointing in the right direction, because <laughs> you can set the camera up, kind of step to the side and see what's showing up in the screen, and that's what your pictures will look like. That'll be the background, that'll be the direction of your camera. So if you're, if you've got the camera facing at a, at an angle that's a little too low, and you know, it can really get tricky, you can be off by two or three degrees on your angle and be shooting right off the top of the deer antlers. Uh, so I guess I like that camera. The one that has received the most positive feedback or the the best, most volume uh, as it relates to good feedback has been the Strike Force this year. It's the small, compact sub micro series that has the standard infrared flash. You know, that, the flash on that camera goes up to about 100 feet. Uh, nighttime images are super fantastic on that camera. So, you know, I guess from my personal experience, I'd say it's those two. That, that's good advice because I can't tell you how many times when you don't have that screen in the back and you're setting your camera up because sometimes when you're setting the cameras over a natural scrape, not one that you set up, you know, the distance from where that deer's coming in and using the linking branch is not as great. So you're relatively close and you take your best guess and then you pull the card and you have 150 images and they all look like they're bucks and you cut them off right above the ears. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't see what they have. I mean, it's just frustrating. So right. when, when you uh, started, when you asked the question earlier about the height of the camera on a tree, you know, before you finish the question, the first thing that crossed my mind was I have some that are, you know, physically on the 
tree, they're 18 inches, 24 inches off the ground, but that's because the land in front of the camera kind of slopes away from the camera. So, you know, I need to get low because that's the best light, sight line for my camera to pick up the full body of the deer. Then I've got one that I actually have to take a step ladder because it's a real steep hill right in front of the camera, and I want to catch the deer when they're cresting the hill. So Yeah, absolutely. That's so it. that little screen helps me make sure that I'm not too far, you know, too high or too low when I set that camera up. Well, thank you, Tom, for joining us. We want to remind everybody this is Browning Trail Cameras. Tom, what's the website people can go to to check out all your cameras? They can go to www.browningtrailcameras.com. Browningtrailcameras.com. You've got to check out their Facebook page also because these guys are posting really cool shots at the, almost every day. The other thing that I want to remind everybody, we have Kristen Schmidt, our blogger, at deerandeerhunting.com. She's been using Browning Trail Camera, and you got to check out some of the, the images she has as well. But, Tom, uh, thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it, and uh, we hope th that uh, the summer kind of flies by so you can get out in the woods too. Hey, I appreciate that, guys. I do appreciate you having me on. Y'all have a great day. Yeah, All you right. too. Thanks, Tom. What a cool guy. Uh, and, and the thing about it is, as is, is Tom knows and as we know, Brad, these guys have been uh, in the camera industry for a long time. And they've been, these cameras really are nice. I mean, yeah. I used one of these last year. I got 18 different bucks on camera with that one camera. You, you always wonder when they're brand new, you know, how good the camera is. And because you and I see a lot of them that mm -hmm. are subpar, is what I would say. And, and like when you're telling me the stories of how good it was, I mean, it just gives you credibility right away with their, their experience. And, and with so cool. much technology built into them, it's not only just their cameras. There's a lot of good cameras out there. But this one is. I just, I don't like the complicated stuff. I like to turn the thing on, a couple easy instructions like he said, and that tip there, I'm going to do that. I'm basically just card one, card two, and a lot of times there's, it's a little tricky. you got to get to make sure, okay, that one's formatted right, and just pop them in, pop them out, and you're not going to have any problems. The, the one thing that I have noticed with trail cameras, if you're using multiple brands, it is really important to keep all your Browning SD cards versus your Cuddy Mac. With that versus, camera. Yeah, because uh, the, the, the electronics must be similar, but if you put one of the, say, you know, cameras, other cards in a Browning, it may not function as well. So it's important to keep If it's formatted that for that one, I agree with you 100%. If you, you, and, I, and we all have that. I mean, how many of us have the same camera? We don't. Oh. Um, you pull that one card out, you got to make sure that it goes with that camera. But the, some of the other things as far as um, the tips, good tips. How many times you go out there and you think you got that camera positioned at the right spot, and then you come through and you got part of a deer, or, you know, you got a its butt or its head or you know halfway across um, that's something that you just got to kind of play with and make sure you have it right before you basically sink all your confidence into that camera and come back two weeks later and you don't have any photos yeah you got to figure that out beforehand yes uh, it's gonna save you a, a, a not only frustration but time because time is of the essence especially as you get closer to deer season I'm trying to figure those things out a couple things we wanted to end on here Brad um, was the uh, we're going to end on the uh, uh, the Tree Stand Safety Awareness Month. I was going to try to fit some other things in here. We're running a little bit long, but we want to remind everybody we have articles, we have videos, and it's not just your normal humdrum stuff. It's really good information on how to stay safe hunting out of a tree stand. Check it out. It's right there on the homepage of DeerAndDeerHunting.com. And also check out those uh, the ultralight vests that we have on sale. We're not going to have a lot of them. Once they're gone, we're probably not going to have any more. It's the Hunter Safety System Ultralight Harness right there at Shop Deer Hunting. You're going to be able to find it. It's $109. You're not going to find a better harness at that price, and it's going to save your life. So it's a good thing to have. Brad, you have one other thing to end on here? One thing I want to bring up is uh, the brand new Heart Attack Arrows. This is a deal that we put together with Carbon Express, Dix, and ourselves. So you got to check it out. If you buy this box of arrows, Carbon Express is going to buy you a subscription of Deer and Deer Hunting for the year. So you're going to get all 10 issues. You know, it's a great deal. They're great arrows. We're going to try to line up Lenny Resmer to tell us a little bit about the engineering behind the arrows. Hopefully it'll be in the next week or two. But check them out. They're available at Dick's. They're supposed to be in the stores now. The box, if you look, it has a little Deer and Deer Hunting information right there on top. There's a card inside. All you have to do is do it electronic. It's simple. It's easy. Check it out. It's a great arrow. So all you people who were contacting me on Facebook who said, 
hey, send me a sample of DDH, right there's your sample. <laughs> you need new arrows anyways. You gotta get some new arrows anyways. You're gonna get a free sample of DDH. And what, what floors me, Brad, this is our, we're entering our 38th year for deer and deer hunting. And there's still a, people out there who never heard of deer and deer hunting. The magazine that started the whitetail industry, Deer and Deer Hunting, get your subscription re-upped, get a new one, and there's your chance. For Brad Rocks, I'm Dan Schmidt. Thanks for joining us. Join us again next week for another episode of Deer Talk Now.